Hello and welcome to this online lecture on spinal injuries hosted by Paramedical Services. The contents of this lecture include some epidemiology and statistics regarding spinal cord injuries, anatomy and physiology of the spine and vertebral canals, the mechanism of injury associated with spinal injuries, the signs and symptoms and the pre-hospital management. Every year around the world, between 250,000 and 500,000 people suffer a spinal cord injury. The incidence of spinal cord injury are four times higher for males than that of females. 79% of all cases of spinal cord injuries are a result of trauma. And of these, 46% are transport related. Under the subsection of transport related injuries, 79% were motorcyclists. This is quite an understandable statistic, being as though motorcyclists are relatively unprotected versus motor car drivers and are at higher risk of injury. 28% of overall cases of spinal cord injuries were a result of falls, and 64% of those were a result of a fall from over one meter high. 11% of spinal cord injuries occurred at work, and 44% of those were related to transport incidents. Population groups most at risk are the 20 to 40 year olds, and then there's also an increase in spinal cord injuries above the age of 70 year old due to falls. Spinal cord injuries have a debilitating effect on the patient. These effects can either be short term or permanent. Patients with spinal cord injuries have an average stay of 133 days in hospital and it costs the healthcare system millions per annum in the management and rehabilitation of patients with spinal cord injuries. These statistics were all extracted from Spinal Cord Injuries Australia, which is a non-profit organization which aids in awareness and management of spinal cord injuries here in Australia. The spinal cord is housed and protected by the vertebral column. The vertebral column extends from the base of the skull all the way down to the pelvis and consists of 33 vertebra, nine of which are fused together to form the sacrum and the coccyx. These are immovable and solid, whereas the rest of the vertebra all allow for a small degree of motion and movement that when working together allow for the flexion and extension, bending and twisting that can be achieved through movement and motion of the spinal column. The vertebral column is divided into five different regions due to the shape, function and structure of the vertebra in each region. Starting from the bottom and working our way up, there are four fused vertebra that make up the coccyx right at the base of the vertebral column. Then there are five fused vertebra that create the sacrum. The sacrum forms part of the pelvic ring and articulates with the pelvic bones. Superior to that are five lumbar vertebra. They're quite large and dense in their structure as they are required to support more of the body weight than the thoracic or cervical vertebra. Superior to the lumbar vertebra, there are 12 thoracic vertebra, all which articulate with a rib to aid in forming the thoracic cavity. And superior to that is the seven cervical vertebra, which allow for the range of motion we can achieve in our neck. The cervical vertebra, as it's the least supported vertebra in the body, is the most susceptible to injuries. And in fact, more than half of spinal cord injuries occur as a result of a cervical injury. The spinal cord is an extension of nervous tissue from the brain, and it's responsible for conducting impulses to and from the brain and the different body regions. The spinal cord extends all the way down to approximately first and second lumbar vertebra and then extending down from there are just pairs of nerves branching out through the vertebra to the lower portions of the body. The spinal cord and the brain are surrounded and protected by the meninges and cerebral spinal fluid, 
which is in constant circulation around the brain and spinal cord. The spinal cord lays within the vertebral canal on the posterior portion of the vertebra. So if we have a look at the diagram on the bottom of the page, the vertebral body that we see over here is on the interior portion or anterior portion of the person's body, whereas the spinal canal in which the spinal cord lays within is on the posterior portion where the spinous processes are. You can actually feel down the spinal processes to be able to count vertebra, which help to locate the site of an injury. Between each vertebra is a spongy disc, which acts as a shock absorber and a separator between each of the vertebra. And it's at the point of these gaps between the vertebra where there's an extension of two nerve bundles which leave the spinal cord and supply nervous tissue to the different regions of the body. There are 33 pairs of spinal nerves each leaving the vertebra and they're named after the vertebra in which they extend out of. There are eight cervical spinal nerve pairs and that's because the first pair of cervical nerves actually extend out from the occipital bone. And then there are 12 thoracic spinal nerve pairs, 5 lumbar spinal nerve pairs, 5 sacral spinal nerve pairs, and 1 coccygeal spinal nerve pair. These nerve bundles or nerve pairs are responsible for distributing nervous tissue to different regions of the body, carrying sensory, motor, and autonomic signals. They're arranged in such an order that it can actually be mapped out on the body in something that's called dermatomes. And if we have a look at the diagram on the right hand side, we can see the order in which these pairs of nerves extend out and feed certain regions of the body forming these dermatomes. Dermatomes can be particularly helpful in spinal cord injuries where people have either had loss of sensation or motor function in particular areas and as this can help to indicate which part of the spine has been damaged or at which level the spine has been damaged that there's no longer transmission of signals to and from the areas of the skin. So for example, if we were to come across a patient who had lost sensation in their left and their right thumbs, it would be safe to say that there was an injury around the C6 vertebra because the C6 nerves have been damaged as they feed the thumb and the forefinger on either side of the body. Whereas if a patient lost sensational function of their middle finger, that would be related to a C7 injury. Or if a patient had lost all sensation below their nipple line, that it would be an injury associated with the fourth thoracic vertebra. The dermatomes are very helpful in assessing your patient, particularly when they have any neurological deficits. It is quite a difficult map to try and remember. However, if you pick a few key dermatomes to commit to memory, this can drastically help with your assessment of your patient. Some important and recommended dermatomes to remember are C6, which is the thumb and the forefinger on either side, C7, the middle finger on either side, and C8, which is the fourth and fifth finger on either side. T4 is approximately the nipple line, and T9 or 10 is approximately the level of the umbilicus. C3, which is the front and back of the neck, and C2, the back of the head. Moving on to some of the common causes of spinal trauma. The majority of spinal trauma is a result of blunt trauma relating to things such as motor vehicle accidents, motorbike or motorcycle accidents, MVA pedestrians, shallow water diving accidents, falls from a height, sports injuries, recreational activities, and then assault from blunt and penetrating traumas. The common mechanism involved in injuries with the spinal cord or the spinal canal have to do with hyperflexion and extension. 
This is generally a result of that acceleration, deceleration injury, which can result from motor vehicle accidents, falls from the height, and any incidents where there has been a significant blow to the head. These type of injuries can cause tearing of ligaments and instability, leading to things such as dislocation of the vertebra. And as the vertebra move, they can then compress and injure the spinal cord and the nerves extending out from it, or other things such as a herniated or a slipped disc. And we can see in the diagram over here on the right hand side, how that disc has bulged out or herniated and is compressing the spinal cord and the nerves extending out of that spinal canal. Fractures, which can be a result of most blunt or penetrating types of trauma, can include things such as a wedge compression, which is quite common when there's been forces placed on the spinal cord from falls from a height or trauma to the head and neck, ejection from vehicles, and shallow diving accidents and incidents. Other types of traumas and fractures can lead to bone fragments, lacerating and puncturing the spinal cord, disrupting signals below the site of the injury. These different causes and mechanisms of injury can lead to stretching, bruising, laceration or compression of the spinal cord. Injury to the spinal cord could be incomplete, which means that there is still some transmission of signals below the site of injury, or a complete injury to the spinal cord, which means that there is no longer any sensory or motor function below the site of that injury. Understanding some of the mechanism involved in spinal canal and spinal cord injuries we are able to suspect an injury when there is a significant mechanism of injury involved. And this would then prompt us in the pre-hospital setting to take spinal precautions and immobilization. These can include anything from a fall from any vehicle, including a scooter, skateboard, bicycle, motorcycle or quad bike. Any victim of a shallow water diving incident a high-speed motor vehicle accident or road traffic accident involving any sudden acceleration, deceleration or lateral forces, ejection from any type of vehicle, death of a person in the same compartment of any vehicle, falls from a height. This can include any height, particularly in the elderly patient, but generally anything over one meter statistically can cause a spinal injury However, a significant mechanism of injury is associated with a fall from a height above three meters. Industrial accidents, particularly when objects have fallen onto the patient, any severe penetrating wound such as an impelled object or a gunshot wound near the spinal column. Due to the significant mechanism of injury involved in head injuries, there's generally an associated C-spine injury, so we would take spinal precautions. Enemy trauma related incident that results in unconsciousness as well as polytrauma where there has been a multiple blunt force trauma to the head, neck, torso or pelvis. Signs and symptoms of a spinal injury or spinal cord injury can include anything from pain, tenderness and deformity over regions of the spine numbness or a loss of sensation, paresthesia, which is that pins and needles sensation, weakness or heaviness in the limbs, loss of bowel or bladder control, paralysis, which depending on the level that the injury has occurred at could lead to things such as paraplegia or quadriplegia or tetraplegia. Paraplegia is paralysis of the lower extremities, so the legs, and tetraplegia, or also known as quadriplegia, is paralysis of all four limbs. Now, depending on the height or the level of the injury would depend on how much of the body is paralyzed. So if we were to have a look at an injury at approximately the L1 vertebra, this would result in paralysis of the lower two extremities versus an injury that occurs at the C4 vertebra leading to paralysis of the chest, the upper extremities, 
the abdominal pelvic region and the lower extremities. So the higher the injury on the spinal cord or spinal canal, the worse the symptoms are going to be and the more debilitating the injury is for the patient. Any injury involving the C-spine, in particular C-spine 2, 3, 4 and 5, house the nerves that innervate the respiratory system and stimulate the diaphragm to move, which all aid in breathing. And if these were to be injured or severed at any point, this could lead to respiratory arrest in a patient. The extent of the injury also heavily depends on whether there is a complete spinal cord injury or an incomplete spinal cord injury. An incomplete spinal cord injury results in there still being some sensor and motory functions below the point of the injury, whereas a complete spinal cord injury means that there is no sensation or motor function below the point of the injury. Generally with complete spinal cord injuries, we may see specific signs and symptoms such as a prior prism, which is a sustained erection that occurs due to vasodilation below the point of the injury, or more severe signs and symptoms such as neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is a result of blood pressure changes due to vasodilation. As nerves control the diameter of the blood vessels in the body, when there's a severing of nerve signals getting to the blood vessels below the point of an injury, all those blood vessels below that point vasodilate and relax because they're no longer stimulated to stay constricted. And as these blood vessels all relaxed and dilate, the blood pressure inside them drops dramatically. And this is what leads to the signs and symptoms of shock that you can see in a complete spinal cord injury. And please note here that even though we've spoken quite a lot about the paralysis below the point of an injury, a patient's ability to walk or move does not indicate that they do not have a spinal injury. So please note if the mechanism of injury is appropriate for spinal precautions to be taken and or if there are any signs or symptoms of a spinal injury, we need to take standard precautions of looking after that patient's spine, preventing any further movement and preventing any further damage from occurring. This can all be achieved through our spinal immobilization techniques. Spinal immobilization requires four stages, the first of which is manual stabilization, also known as inline stabilization, applying a C collar when dealing with a patient who may be trapped inside a vehicle, confined space, or requires vertical extrication. We can make use of the KED, which is the Kendrick extrication device, and then spine board straps, sandbags, and head blocks to immobilize the body. In regards to manual stabilization, this is to manually hold the head in the neutral position, which we can see depicted on the right hand side of the screen here. When applying manual stabilization to a pediatric, any patient under the age of eight, it's recommended that you place either a towel or some kind of object or padding underneath their shoulders and torso to elevate their torso by about approximately 2.5 centimeters to ensure that neutral alignment of their spine. The opposite can be applied for a patient laying flat on their back. If their neck is not in that neutral position, then you can place something underneath their head to help obtain the correct position. It's absolutely vital to obtain neutral alignment before measuring and applying the C collar because this will ensure that you actually get the correct sizing and that you don't cause any further damage. The purpose of the rigid cervical collar is to limit C-spine movement and compression and to aid in maintaining that neutral position. The rigid collar limits flexion by approximately 90%. It limits extension and lateral bending and rotation by about 50%, but it must be used in conjunction with other mobilization devices as movement can still occur and the collar must be the appropriate size for the patient in order to be effective. There are some complications to be aware of when fitting and using a C collar. If the collar is too large, it will hyperextend the patient's C spine, which can cause more damage or injury. 
If the collar is too small for the patient, it's not going to provide the appropriate stability. If the patient needs to vomit, a collar can impede clearing of the airways, which could lead to aspiration. And if the collar is too tight, it can impede the external jugular blood flow and could result in raised intracranial pressure, which can be very detrimental for the head injured patient. It's important to know the complications of your equipment and also know how to use them appropriately. The Kendrick extrication device or the KED, which aids in immobilization of the head, neck and spine during activities such as extrication and rescue. The complications of the KED can include restrictions of the patient's head and just like the C collar that can result in aspiration if the patient needs to vomit and they cannot clear their own airway. If the chest straps are too tight this can cause restrictions on respiratory function. If it's not correctly fitted underneath the patient's arms when pulling and lifting the patient using the KED this can result in movement and further injury. And if the leg straps are too tight, this can cut off circulation to the lower limbs. The kid's maximum weight capacity is 227 kilograms. A spine board is only a lifting device. It is not designed to be a stretcher. So the purpose of the spine board is to safely strap the patient onto them and move them to an object in which they can be transported on, such as your ambulance stretcher. To successfully and safely place somebody on a spine board, we need a minimum of four people. One person is to be continuously supporting the head holding C-spine, whereas the other two will be placed at the patient's torso and hip. The fourth person will be there to slide the board under the patient as they log roll them. The attendant at the head is always in control of the move and we must always ensure that when we roll the patient onto their side before rolling them onto the backboard we need to assess down the back and the patient's spine. The patient must be securely strapped onto the spine board before lifting and moving to an ambulance stretcher. The complications of the spine board can again include the inability of the patient to protect their own airway or clear their own airway during vomiting and this can lead to aspiration as well as pressure injuries and pain due to the spine board itself. If we have a look at the diagram on the right hand side we can see the natural curvature of the patient's spine and if we were to try and lay a patient flat on a spine board a lot of the weight is pressing into the thoracic and the sacral regions this can cause pressure sores on the patient if they've left on the board or strapped on the board for too long. And this can also increase the patient's degree of pain. So again, the spine board is not for somebody to be transported on. They're to be lifted onto an ambulance stretcher for transportation. There are many different types of boards and stretchers available in the emergency services. And we have a few pictures to show you so that you can familiarize yourself with the different types of stretches and boards available. The top two diagrams over here depict the different types of spine boards. The basket stretcher or stoke stretcher is what a patient can be placed into during a rescue mission, whether that be a steep slope rescue, a high angle rescue or helicopter rescue. Then other types of stretchers and boards include carry sheets, and folding stretches, which is still very commonly used in sporting and military services. The vacuum mattress is mainly used in aeromedical services where there's a patient that requires complete spinal mobilization. The mattress is made out of tiny little styrofoam balls and once this has been molded and shaped to the patient, they use a vacuum to suck the air out of the stretcher which conforms to the patient's body, keeps them immobilized and also conforms to the shape of their spine, reducing things such as pressure sores and discomfort that one would experience on the spine board. And then there's scoop stretchers. Scoop stretchers can either be taken apart just at one side, depicted in the diagram on the bottom right here, or they can be completely separated from one another 
And then there are many different types of ambulance stretchers available in different services. It's important to be aware of all the equipment that you are expected to use in your service that you work for and be aware of any limitations, complications and of course the indications of that equipment. The purpose of spinal mobilization is to limit any further movement and any further damage to the person's spine or spinal cord. Now it's important to realize that the risks of not performing spinal mobilization could result in paraplegia, quadriplegia, chronic pain, a financial burden for that patient, major life impact, and possible respiratory arrest and death if there's damage done above the level of the C2. And in the pre-hospital care setting where our aim is to do no further harm, it's important that we do spinal mobilize patients if the mechanism of injury or signs and symptoms indicate that there could be a spinal injury. This concludes our presentation on spinal injuries. If you have any further inquiries or queries, please don't hesitate to contact paramedical services.